थ्री टू वन एंड वी आर लाइव नाउ गुड इवनिंग आई वेलकम एवरी वन ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ इंडियन रोमिटॉलॉजी एसोसिएशन द कोविड हैज literally taught us that the virtual platform is one of the best way to uh, connect with uh, continuing medical education i think those two years of experiment especially with our uh, monthly and bimonthly lecture series had a uh, good um, uh, attendance and that prompted us to continue the same program uh, when the continuing in the next in, in 2023 and this program we named it as virtual connect 2023 and the planned proposal is every month we would like to have the world's best expert to deliver the lecture uh, on the specific topic uh, i think this is going to be go on and uh, of course we are headed by uh, current present president dr dharmanand and uh, dr aman sharma and the entire ira ec team will take through that Uh, in addition also to just to remind you that we also have started another program especially directed against post graduate students and trainees uh, a virtual case discussion which we are having two cases once every month you can also just join and enjoy and learn uh, a lot things about it uh, with this brief introduction to this program uh, i hand over uh, the proceedings to dr aman sharma aman sharma yes. uh thank you sir it's indeed uh, it's my turn to introduce the speaker today and i think uh, it's my great privilege and uh, huge honor uh, that uh, we have none other than uh, uh, dr peter grayson uh, as the first uh, speaker of this ira virtual connect 2023 actually in fact for the rheumatology audiences all across the globe and india he just doesn't need any introduction the name is enough but i think for those who are the beginners uh, he has been a trail blazer in the field of vasculitis and relapsing polychondritis the fields which are very close to my heart also uh, he has been the the leader in the dc vas uh, studies which have recently introduced all the classification criteria of different vasculitic disorders uh, he is uh, the Uh, the the director of vasculitis program at the nih uh, he is presently earl stadman investigator at the niams his basic interests uh, uh, are are uh, widespread uh, across clinical and translational research areas in different vasculitic disorders biomarker discovery advanced molecular imaging molecular classification clinical trials genetics and genomics and uh, also uh, he has special interest in advanced imaging as surrogate marker for vascular inflammation in large vessel vasculitis and we in india happen to see a lot of uh, takayasu i think that is of a great interest to us and i think the first topic is vexus uh, which as dr castner always says rhymes like texas and <laughs> he uh, we can't couldn't have asked for anybody else than the corresponding of author of the nejm publication which described vexus syndrome in i think it was late october of 2020 and um, uh, it was kind of a game changer in the sense that we all clinician have grown up to have that pattern recognition where we looked at the phenotype and would make a diagnosis but these his group took us from phenotype based approach to a genotype based approach where you could have a a uh, 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 a relapsing polychondritis you could have a joint cell arthritis you could have a polyarthritis nodosa but if that patient happens to have a uh, certain syndromic genetic uba1 mutation which um, of course he will talk about it then that diagnosis changes from a phenotype approach to a genotype approach to be a vexus syndrome and i think that spectrum is expanding i won't come between you and him i know of the, the i've been getting messages since morning what is the time when he is going to speak i the, that enthusiasm is already palpable so ladies and gentlemen i present to you peter grayson peter please thank you so much sir it's a pleasure to be with you today um coming to you from Washington DC in the United States um i 
as, a, as mentioned, I'm going to talk to you today about the Vexus syndrome story, and I really am going to talk to you about it um, and share with you the backstory of how this disease was discovered, because it's really interesting. There was a lot of uh, twists and turns and a lot of good luck along the way that led us to make this discovery. Um, and I really am going to try to make the point to you today that the Vexus syndrome is pointing us into a, a new direction in rheumatology and how to think about disease classification. Um, so as I often do when talking about Vexus, the easiest way to, to teach people about the disease if you haven't seen a case, and I suspect many of you already have, is to tell you about a case. And this is the first case of Vexus that I ever saw. And it was a man in his late 50s who in 2011, he'd been previously healthy, and then he developed a strange pattern of symptoms, which for him included recurrent fevers. He had orchitis with testicular swelling and inflammation. He described these painful, deep uh, skin nodules on his extremities. He reported episodes of face swelling, um, periorbital swelling, which I'll show you a picture of in a minute. He'd had recurrent thromboembolic events. He'd had uh, two different deep vein thromboses at the time we saw him. Uh, and he described a few episodes of swelling and tenderness on the external penna of the ear that sounded to us like um, auricular chondritis. And his local doctors had a really difficult time treating him. They had tried numerous steroid sparing medications. The only thing that reliably controlled his inflammation and, and alleviated these symptoms was uh, glucocorticoids, and he was requiring moderate doses of daily prednisone. And so eventually, they took advantage of a program that we have at the National Institutes of Health called the Undiagnosed Disease Program, uh, or the UDP. And the Undiagnosed Disease Program is an NIH program that is now spread out in a network across the United States where physicians can refer complicated patients, patients who do not seem to have an easily defined medical diagnosis. Often these are patients that have really strange pattern of symptoms that just don't fit any one specific category. And so in 2013, this patient traveled to Bethesda, Maryland to the National Institutes of Health. And I went and saw him at the bedside because I was doing consultations for the Undiagnosed Disease Program. And I saw him with a doctor named Amanda Umbrello who works in Dan Kastner's group, who studies periodic fever syndromes and autoinflammation. And we sat at the bedside of this patient and he told us something very remarkable. He said, I am on 25 milligrams of prednisone a day. If you drop my prednisone to 20 milligrams a day, within a single day, I will flare. My disease will come back. And we thought you're at the National Institutes of Health. You're in the inpatient hospital wards. Let's do that experiment. So we dropped his prednisone just by five milligrams. And sure enough, the next day, he started to develop those painful skin nodules. And he had this periorbital swelling around his left eye that I'm showing here. And we watched his C-reactive protein go from 30 milligrams per liter to over 300 milligrams per liter in just a matter of three or four days. We did a biopsy of one of those skin nodules and we saw medium vessel vasculitis in the deep dermis. And so with that combination of testicular inflammation, deep uh, medium vessel vasculitis of skin, we labeled him as an atypical form of polyarteritis nodosa. Some things didn't quite fit, but that was the closest diagnosis we had. And then uh, his doctors struggled over the next many years to try to get his inflammation under control. And we helped them from afar. We tried anakinra and he had these pretty horrendous skin reactions, injection site reactions, almost requiring a skin graft at one point. And he started to develop progressive bone marrow failure. It first was a macrocytic anemia, then thrombocytopenia, and his inflammation was requiring higher and higher doses of daily prednisone. And eventually in 2017, we, uh, performed a bone marrow biopsy. At this point, his macrocytic anemia was so severe that he required blood transfusions every couple of weeks. His marrow was non-diagnostic. It was hypercellular with a myeloid predominance, and he had negative uh, genetic genomic studies for myelodysplastic syndrome, which was our clinical concern at the time. And so we just didn't know what he had. Did he have 
uh, a vasculitis with inflammation that was affecting his bone marrow? Did he have a primary bone marrow problem that was causing inflammation? Uh, no one was certain. And we continued to try our best to treat him and he, he continued to get worse with fevers. He now developed these recurrent ground glass pulmonary infiltrates that only responded to glucocorticoids. He developed a disseminated atypical mycobacterial infection. He needed platelet transfusions in addition to blood transfusions. He was hospitalized many times. And unfortunately, in 2020, he died from complications of his disease. And this is one of these cases that stayed in my head because uh, first, his disease was so sensitive to steroids. You know, below a certain dose, his disease would flare. If we had him on enough steroids, his disease was under relative control. We couldn't find any steroid sparing treatments. And I hadn't really seen this pattern of bone marrow failure combined with systemic inflammation and vasculitis before. But over the next couple of years, in 2016, I saw two more cases just like this guy. One of them was through the Undiagnosed Disease Program, and the other one was in Dan Kastner's uh, fever clinic. Um, and so uh, we decided as a group to sequence these patients, and we sent their blood for whole exome sequencing. And we were looking for novel variants that these three men shared, um, and we found nothing. And we were stuck, and that's where we were. Until the summer of 2019, when I received a phone call from a clinical geneticist working in Dan Kastner's group named David Beck. And David said, uh, I employed this genetic algorithm to identify patients with new diseases, and I found three men that you have been describing in the clinical records. And I knew exactly the three men he was talking about because I'd been thinking about these cases for a few years. And what David did, as Dr. Sharma alluded to in the introduction, is he took a genotype-first approach to discovering disease. And patients that come through the National Institutes of Health very often get whole exome sequencing but it is only a minority of patients in whom we are able to uh, arrive at a genetic diagnosis. And what happens is the data from these patients accumulates into genetic databases. And David had access to 2,560 exomes that were collected in the NIH Undiagnosed Disease Program and Dan Kastner's Periodic Fever Database. And by a stroke of good luck, uh, David was interested in the ubiquitin pathway. And the reason we were interested in that pathway is because a number of autoinflammatory diseases had been discovered due to genetic perturbations in this ubiquitin gene pathway. Um, and so he took the data from these 2,560 individuals. He restricted it to only studying 841 genes that were related to ubiquitin, and then started to hand search through every one of those genes to see if he could find common rare genetic variants. He employed this filter strategy. So the variant had to be intolerant to haploinsufficiency, had to be completely novel, and he was looking for shared variants. So this is a, a way to ensure that uh, a shared variants across cases were likely to be disease-causing or pathogenic. And when he employed this algorithm, he found those three men that I was talking to you about that had a missense mutation at codon 41 in a gene called UBA1. And he called me and we began an exciting collaboration that took about a year and a half to arrive at the disease that we now know as Vexus syndrome. The first problem that we had as we were thinking about these cases is illustrated by these chromatograms. And so this is codon 41 of the gene UBA1. And these are the first three patients we identified. And you should see a single nucleotide peak at each loci in codon 41. And what you'll immediately notice where the black arrows are is instead of one peak, these people had two peaks. Now, UBA1 is an X-linked gene. These are men. So they should only have one read, one X chromosome. And yet, in each case, there, was, there were multiple reads. So after ex excluding karyotype abnormalities and the like, we began to entertain the idea that perhaps this was mosaicism in blood. And what I mean by that is some of the cells in blood have this mutation and other cells are normal. And that's why in these men we're getting double peaks. So to start to prove that, 
we said, well, maybe this is a somatic mutation, a mutation that's acquired that's only in blood and it's only in certain cells in the blood. So we did skin biopsies on these patients and we uh, isolated fibroblasts and sequenced them. And sure enough, if you sequence the fibroblasts from these same three men, uh, there's a single peak, they're normal, there's no mutation. So that convinced us that we were dealing with somatic mosaicism, a mutation that's only in blood and only in specific blood populations. So the next thing we did was try to say, okay, well, which cells in blood have the mutation that are providing one peak and which cells in the blood don't have the mutation? And we took advantage of the fact that these patients were all getting bone marrow biopsies for clinical indications due to their progressive bone marrow failure. And we were able to sort out different populations of blood cells and sequence purified populations directly. And so here I'm showing you again, codon 41, UBA1. This is a single patient's chromatogram. And in this case, the red is the wild type. So that's the normal peak. Um, and the blue is the mutation. And if you look at the level of uh, hematopoietic stem cells, those cells that are self-renewable in your bone marrow that make billions of blood cells a day, you will see that there's equal proportion of red and blue peaks, meaning that some of these stem cells have the mutation and some of them are normal. And when you chase that through the myeloid lineages and end up in mature circulating neutrophils and monocytes, you'll notice that it's almost all blue peak, almost all mutation, very little wild type. So that means that in this particular patient, you have a mutation starting in the stem cells and bone marrow. It becomes restricted to neutrophils and monocytes such that if you draw blood from that patient, almost all of their neutrophils in circulation have this mutation. In contrast, if you go through the lymphoid lineages and end up with mature T cells and B cells, you'll see it's a single peak, a red peak. These are normal cells. There's no mutation in the circulating lymphocytes in this patient. So something is happening at the level of the bone marrow where the mutation becomes lineage restricted to myeloid populations, and it's negatively selected out in lymphoid populations. The T cells and the B cells can't tolerate the mutation. They do not mature. And this is uh, that same concept just quantified by a number called the variant allele fraction. This is a, basically an estimate of the size of the mutant clone in blood. And you can see no mutations in skin fibroblasts, no mutations in uh, B cells and T cells, but look at the burden of mutation in myeloid cells, almost 100% in neutrophils. Um, then we gathered as a group and we started to look at the bone marrow biopsies and the aspirates from these patients. And we did this with Kathy Calvo, who's a hematopathologist at the NIH. And these are the first three bone marrow aspirates that we examined. And you'll notice they all had this very striking, unusual feature in that in the myeloid and erythroid precursor cells, they all had vacuoles, these little white dots in the cytoplasm of the cells. And Dr. Calvo said, you know, there's only a few conditions that cause these kinds of vacuoles in myeloid and erythroid precursor cells, things like nutritional deficiencies, like copper deficiency, but we excluded that in these patients. Um, and this became a big clue to the disease. And for the hematopathologist out there, this is uh, a really sensitive finding for Vexus syndrome, not entirely specific, but almost every patient with Vexus will have these vacuoles in their bone marrow aspirates. In fact, it's the V in, in Vexus stands for these vacuoles. Um, it's something that often wasn't commented on or, or even realized by pathologist on patients who have Vexus syndrome and maybe 10 years ago had a, a marrow done before we knew about this diagnosis. So it is worthwhile if you have a patient that you think has Vexus to go back and look at their old bone marrow aspirate if it's available for these vacuoles. Okay, so we have a mutation, starts in the bone marrow, becomes lineage restricted to myeloid cells, and these patients have severe inflammation that's difficult to treat. So what is going on? And this is a monocyte from a healthy patient, bone marrow derived monocyte. And this is a monocyte from a patient with this UBA1 mutation that defines Vexus syndrome. And you can see the, the cell is toxic. The mutation is toxic to these cells. And when we identified, we sorted out neutrophils and monocytes versus lymphocytes and did bulk RNA sequencing, we were able to see that a number of inflammatory cytokines are upregulated in the myeloid populations from these patients. So 
uh, IL-1 is elevated, IL-6, TNF, uh, type 1 and type 2 interferons. And that really is the way we think about this disease mechanistically, is inducing a state of hyperinflammation in monocytes and neutrophils uh, because of a toxic mutation. And this is why the disease is so difficult to treat. You can block one cytokine pathway, but there's redundant inflammation and, and different pathways that are also activated. Um, just a little bit about ubiquitin and disease. Uh, at the NIH, there's a, a scientist named Akeem Warner who uh, studies ubiquitin, and he's a co-senior author on the VEXIS paper in the New England Journal. Um, and his, was very helpful in uh, helping us understand the mechanism of what's going on. Uh, ubiquitin is a fundamental uh, process for cellular health. So it tags misfolded proteins for degradation by the proteasome. Uh, it influences cell signaling. It influences protein localization within a cell. It does a number of fundamental things. And it does it in a three-step process, E1, E2, and E3 enzymes. And as I mentioned at the outset, we were interested in the ubiquitin pathway because there's over 600 E3 enzymes and a lot of genetic diseases have been discovered due to mutations within these enzymes. If you go to the E2, the second step of ubiquitin, it's less specific, so there's 40 enzymes. But what we're talking about with these VEXIS patients is a acquired mutation in the E1 enzyme in the initial step of all cellular ubiquitin. This is the UBA1 is the master switch for ubiquitin. Um, and it is why this disease is a somatic disease. It's an acquired mutation. It's not a germline disease. It isn't a mutation that you inherited from your parents and passed along to your children. It's a mutation that spontaneously arises only in blood in an individual later in life. If this mutation were in the germline, it would be embryologically lethal. And we named the disease VEXIS. It's an acronym. Again, the V stands for those vacuoles that we see on the aspirates. E1 enzyme, this is the protein encoded for by UBA1. It's an X-linked gene, as I mentioned, um, and it produces autoinflammation uh, of myeloid cells. And it's somatic. It's a different form of genetics. This is not a germline disease. And you can see some of the salient clinical features here with inflammation of the lungs, the skin, the cartilage, uh, and the bone marrow. Okay, and so now I'm gonna teach you a little bit about how to spot and recognize this disease. It's very easy to recognize it once you know what to look for. Um, and to give you a feel for that, uh, let me tell you about the first 25 patients that we reported on in the New England Journal. What you'll notice is the age at disease onset is 64 years uh, um, on average. Uh, this is a disease of adulthood. In fact, it's a disease, a disease exclusively of adulthood, beginning in the fifth decade of life or later. The youngest patient we've seen at the time of symptom onset with Vexus syndrome was 45 years old. And in these original 25 patients, 100% of them were men. This functions like an X-linked recessive disease. Women have two X alleles. Therefore, if they acquire a mutation on one allele, they're protected by their second X chromosome. And that's why the disease is almost exclusively found in men, but that's not true anymore and is evolving, uh, particularly women who have uh, karyotype abnormalities, so monosomy of the X, acquired monosomy in, in bone marrow stem cells are at risk to develop Vexa syndrome, and even some recent reports of karyotypically normal women having Vexa syndrome. So I think we're under-recognizing the disease in women, but still far and away, it's, ex it's predominantly a disease of men. And this is what got rheumatologists and hematologists excited is that these patients carried a number of clinical diagnoses um, and they were accurate clinical diagnoses. They met diagnostic or classification criteria for these conditions. Uh, by far and away, the most common was relapsing polychondritis, but also neutrophilic dermatoses like sweet syndrome, uh, forms of vasculitis like polyarteritis nodosa and giant cell arteritis, and then uh, hematologic conditions like myelodysplastic syndrome and even multiple myeloma. And just a couple clinical pictures and some concepts here. Uh, the disease causes chondritis of the ear and the nose, not usually the airway. And so this is why these patients are labeled uh, relapsing polychondritis. It is a subtle chondritis. It does not usually lead to permanent damage. So these patients do not get the floppy ear, the cauliflower ear. They don't get um, 
uh, nasal septal perforation or saddle nose deformities. Um, so if you don't ask specifically about chondritis, you may miss it uh, because these episodes are often transient and subtle. There's a range of skin manifestations. Dermatologists need to know about this disease. It often first presents in the dermatology clinic. Here's a couple of pictures of the injection site reactions to anakinra. For that reason, we actually don't use anakinra anymore. That periorbital swelling that many of these patients will have, they get a range of vasculitis of the skin, including leukocytoclastic vasculitis, but also medium vessel vasculitis. And this is a picture of those uh, uh, neutrophilic dermatose-like lesions, uh, which biopsy histologically look like uh, sweet syndrome. Uh, from the lung standpoint, they get ground glass infiltrates, they get exudative uh, pleural effusions. This is an open lung resection of a patient with ground glass, and it's showing a sterile neutrophilic alveolitis. So those mutant neutrophils are going into the lung and causing problems. Often these patients are misdiagnosed as a pneumonia. Uh, and even episodes are, are instances where we've seen bronchial vasculitis. So I have not, I don't know of a systemic disease that causes uh, vasculitis of the bronchial arteries, but Vexus is one of them. Um, the natural history of this disease is important to think about. It starts often as an inflammatory disease. And then one of the first hematologic problems they have is a macrocytosis, an elevated MCV. We're trying to teach our dermatologists, if you see a patient with um, you know, cutaneous vasculitis and an unexplained elevated MCV, then you need to consider Vexus syndrome in those patients. And here's an example from a, a single patient where over time, this patient becomes progressively anemic and develops uh, red blood cell transfusion dependence. Their platelet counts are also falling over a number of years. These green arrows are bone marrow biopsies that were performed that were all non-diagnostic, showing again, hypercellular marrow with those vacuolated myeloid cells. And eventually six years after onset of symptoms, this patient finally met WHO criteria for a myelodysplastic syndrome. So over time, this inflammation and problems in the bone marrow can lead to an overt myelodysplastic syndrome. In many ways, this is sort of a pre-malignant condition for, for hematologic malignancies. Um, when we first were thinking about these patients, we were really guided by literature coming from our colleagues in France, where they have long been interested in the overlap between myelodysplastic syndromes and inflammation. And we think that Vexus syndrome explains a lot of these cases that, that had been written about for a number of years, but not all of them. In fact, at the moment, we get referrals for patients that have suspected Vexus syndrome. They have clinical features of Vexus. And about 30% of the time, we can confirm the UBA1 mutation, which means that there's a number of patients that have these kinds of symptoms that don't have Vexus. And we are wondering, are there other mutant genes that will define other syndromes beyond simply Vexus? As I mentioned, most of the patients in our cohort had relapsing polychondritis. They had chondritis of the ear and the nose. And we, as Dr. Sharma had said in the introduction, we have an interest in this disease and we have a prospective ongoing observational cohort of relapsing polychondritis at the NIH. And so at the time of identifying the first couple of patients with Vexus syndrome and recognizing that they had chondritis, we then sequenced our entire RP cohort, um, which at the time was 92 patients. And we said, okay, within relapsing polychondritis, can we discover Vexus syndrome hiding out? And we found seven patients or 8% of RP in our cohort that was actually Vexus syndrome. It was a genetic diagnosis of a UBA1 mutation. All of these seven patients were older men who had hematologic abnormalities. And because of that, we were able to develop a clinical algorithm that works really well for relapsing polychondritis with just three simple variables. So if you have a patient with ear or nose chondritis, if that patient is male or if that patient is older than 50, and they have an MCV greater than 100 or a platelet count of less than 200, it's highly likely that this patient will have Vexus syndrome. And in our cohort, it predicted Vexus syndrome with 97% accuracy. And I think that that is the key clinical clue to this disease, the mean corpuscular volume, the MCV. Um, and I would say to you that in an adult patient who has severe inflammation involving the skin, the cartilage, or the lungs, plus an elevated MCV, that that should really trigger uh, genetic testing for Vexus syndrome. 
Um, and this is data that just came out uh, last week in JAMA. Uh, here we have um, the cartoon of the Vexus uh, syndrome patient, an older man with a whole range of systemic disease. Uh, one thing I haven't really stressed is the, the thromboembolic signal. Uh, 40 to 50% of these patients will have blood clots. They can have venous or arterial. In fact, the prevalence of clotting in Vexus is higher than Bichette's disease. Um, and this is something that deserves more study. But in JAMA this week or last week, we published the first ever prevalence estimates of Vexus syndrome. How common is this disease? And we were able to do that because we, the Geisinger Institute has uh, whole exome sequencing data from a, uh, the community in Pennsylvania in the United States. And so we had access to around 200,000 exomes that were taken in, in the population at large. And we found 11 cases of Vexus syndrome in that. So if you do the math, our prevalence estimates is that Vexus is one in 14,000 people in the United States. That means the Vexus is more common than granulomatosis with polyangiitis or GPA. It means that it's more common than all of the previously defined myelodysplastic syndromes combined. And when you look specifically in men older than 50 years, Vexus has a prevalence of one in 4,000. So this is a rare disease, but it's not exceedingly rare. This is not one of those NIH diseases that you'll never see. If you are a practicing rheumatologist or hematologist, you will see this disease over the course of your career. So it really makes it important that we recognize it. And we watched over the last two years, the field explode, and we've seen a number of researchers around the world get interested in this disease. And that part has been very exciting to us. Here's the first original description in late 2020, 59 papers in 2021, 119 papers in 2022. And we're watching the nuances of Vexus syndrome emerge. So a lot of different expansion of the clinical phenotype. Here we see associated with uh, CIDP, here a case of Vexus with HLH. Uh, the French put out a cohort about a year from the initial description of 116 patients with Vexus syndrome. Uh, so really highlighting that the disease is, is rather prevalent. Um, here's Vexus syndrome manifesting as Kikuchi Fujimoto disease, Vexus syndrome uh, looking like systemic lupus erythematosus uh, from Dr. Sharma, um, Vexus syndrome looking like Bechet's disease. And I think the main point here is that in the tradition of things like tuberculosis or renal cell cancer or even systemic lupus erythematosus, Vexus is the new great mimic in internal medicine and internal medicine doctors need to be aware of this condition. Okay, a little bit on the pathogenic genetic mechanism of disease and then we'll call it a day. Um, most of these patients, 95% of these patients have a mutation in UBA1 exactly at codon 41. And you would think for a genetic disease that the mutations could be randomly distributed through a gene, but that's not the case. There is this mutational hotspot here. So why is that happening? Well, UBA1 encodes two protein isoforms. The long isoform, which goes to the nucleus, where translation is started at codon 1, a methionine at codon 1, and a short cytoplasmic isoform, where translation is initiated at codon 41, a methionine at 41. And this is exactly where most of our Vexus syndrome mutations are occurring. So normally you make this UBA1 isoform in the nucleus, UBA1A, and then you make a UBA1B isoform in the cytoplasm. And in Vexus syndrome, they mutate codon 41, translation of this short isoform skips forward to the next methionine at codon 67, and they make a cytoplasmic isoform called UBA1C that is catalytically impaired. So it doesn't, you lose cytoplasmic ubiquitin. It's why you develop those toxic vacuoles in the cytoplasm of the cells. And even more interesting than that is at codon 41, there's three mutations that define Vexus syndrome. So you can have a missense mutation that results in an amino acid substitution where the methionine either becomes a leucine, a valine, or a threonine. And that is important, and it should be important to us as clinicians, because those specific mutations have prognostic implications. And here we see survival curves. Vexus is a severe disease. In our cohorts, 25% mortality. The median survival time is 10 years from symptom onset. 
And the patients who do the worst are the patients that have the valine variant. These are the patients with the most systemic inflammation, the vasculitis manifestations. And here you're, we're showing the median survival time of nine years from symptom onset, and no patient with the valine variant in our cohort had survived longer than 12 years after symptom onset. So if you're thinking about aggressive therapeutic intervention, the valine patients are probably the ones that deserve the most consideration. Okay, treatment. Uh, this part of the textbook is currently still being written, um, but I'll just highlight to you in broad strokes, what are the goals of medical therapy for this disease? Well, the first one is controlling inflammation, and that's the one most of us have been spending our time thinking about and trying to make headway with. And I would say, despite the number of steroid sparing therapies that are out there, that glucocorticoids, prednisone, remains the foundation of treatment for this disease. These patients often require 10 to 25 milligrams of prednisone a day. And they almost always have a threshold dose whereby they cannot go lower than that dose or their disease will flare immediately. So as rheumatologists managing steroids in these patients, you must do this very carefully. You should not try to aggressively taper glucocorticoids in these patients. Um, they often need some basal amount of steroids. Uh, our preferential biologic therapy is tocilizumab. Uh, we find that it um, is the most effective in our patients, but it never uh, allows us to fully get a patient off of steroids. There's a lot of reports in the literature about the use of JAK inhibitors and specifically ruxolitinib. And we were involved in a paper uh, along with our colleagues from France and Europe uh, looking at ruxolitinib. Our experience with ruxolitinib has been rather poor, uh, despite the fact that our French colleagues have had good success. And we're trying to understand why those differences exist. But for us, it has worsened the cytopenias and caused infections. So we're, we're pretty careful and cautious about use of JAK inhibitors in Vexus syndrome. IL-1 antagonists in theory make a lot of sense, but due to those severe anakinra injection site reactions, we often do not use this medication. Kenakinumab may be effective, and we're seeing some case reports emerge of that. We still use conventional DMARDs, even though the disease is a disease of myeloid cells, there is off-target activation of T cells and, and B cells as they encounter those dying myeloid populations. So things like methotrexate and mycophenolate and azathioprine actually, I think, have a complementary role. Um, and we often use these in combination with tocilizumab. Another way to think about treatment is to eradicate the clone. And I think this is the way forward because this is what will uh, be more durable. This is what potentially could cure the patients. And unfortunately, we just don't know how to do this well yet. They're, the only drug where there's been some signal here are the hypomethylating agents like azacitidine. And there's some case reports of patients whose clones have become undetectable in blood with initiation of these medications. But this is where we're gonna require rheumatology, hematology collaboration. Uh, this is one that you can do, however, and this is where we've had the most success is preventing complications. These patients are immunodeficient because they're lymphopenic because the mutation kills off the lymphocytes. So they're uh, prone to atypical infections like disseminated mycobacterial infections and, and fungal infections. Uh, so we prophylax our patients for, for PJP pneumonia. We prophylax them for varicella zoster. Um, and the thromboembolic disease is a problem. And so we're trying to think about ways to um, uh, manage them in terms of anticoagulation and wondering whether we need to do prophylactic anticoagulation in certain patients. Um, the disease is a disease of bone marrow. And because of that, it's the mutation is only in the blood. So in theory, bone marrow transplantation uh, could be curative and there are reports emerging of allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplantation curing patients with Vexus syndrome. In our cohort, 12 patients have had bone marrow transplant. 11 of them have been, we think, are cured off steroids. One of them died peritransplant, and that's the problem is the mortality rates in transplant are quite high, and we're dealing with a disease of older men, potentially with a lot of comorbidities. Um, so really thinking about this proactively and transplanting a patient early in disease, particularly perhaps those patients with the valine variant, is a strategy that we're entertaining. And, and at the NIH, we have a research protocol undergoing where we're performing transplants in these patients. So what does this disease mean? Well, the main implication, I think, is thinking beyond germline genetics. In rheumatology, we perform genome-wide association studies in almost every disease. And we look for uh, variants in the germline that are increased in patients relative to controls. 
But by definition, these variants have very small effect sizes. So these are not monogenic drivers of disease. These are not really strong causal variants. And if you think about a lot of our diseases, germline genetics don't make sense. A disease like giant cell arteritis starts when you're 60, 70, 80 years old. How can that be driven by a um, and by genetics that you inherit at the time of birth. Um, and most of our diseases don't aggregate in families. So, you know, it's very rare in vasculitis that you see more than one family member with the same uh, uh, disease. Um, so in contrast to germline genetics, somatic mutations make a ton of sense, that these patients can acquire mutations late in life and drive disease. And this is a nice editorial that accompanied the original description of Exa syndrome in the New England Journal, really talking about somatic mu mutations occurring at different points in development. So embryogenesis, early childhood, even out in adulthood. And there's a number of pediatric diseases caused by somatic mutations, but we're starting to see this emerging list of diseases in adulthood. And depending on when a mutation arise, a patient could be more or less mosaic. So out in adulthood, there could be clones and clones driving disease, but they may be very small populations and trying to find and identify those clones is the challenge that awaits. Um, but our genome is unstable. Every cell in our body mutates at least once every week or two, the highest rate in colon, lowest in blood. And you can imagine intrinsic factors like getting older with just cell division and extrinsic environmental factors like inflammation can drive and accelerate that rate of mutagenesis. And I think on that background, every tissue mutating all the time, disease can occur. Um, and I think somatic mutations in rheumatologic diseases will likely be causal in subsets of patients. That's what Vexa syndrome is teaching us. Perhaps they can sustain disease in other subsets of patients. And there's really interesting literature in inflammatory bowel disease about this. And they may contribute to disease-associated events. So why do patients with uh, Sjogren's syndrome develop uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, it's likely due to somatic mutations in B-cell populations. And we're, we've proposed this paradigm, at least thinking about somatic mutations in blood, but we're also going to need to think about them in tissue. But here's our, our paradigm, our conceptual paradigm for blood, is that you can have a mutation that arises in stem cells, and it can become lineage restricted to lymphoid populations and produce autoimmune diseases, or lineage restricted to myeloid populations and produce auto-inflammatory diseases. And there's examples of this, and I think this list will just get bigger and bigger. So Vexa syndrome, somatic mutation in stem cells restricted to myeloid lineages produces auto-inflammation uh, in UBA1, but there's other diseases. So there's evidence of somatic mutations in NLRP3 disease, so in inflammasome. Uh, Ertheim chester disease is a somatic mutation in, in, in BRAF. Uh, in monocyte populations. And on the other hand, Felty syndrome is a somatic mutation in STAT3 restricted to CD8 T cells. These ones are going to be harder to spot in blood because lymphocyte populations are not as abundant as myeloid populations. So we're going to probably need deep sequencing approaches to pick these up. So Vexus is an overlap disease with severe inflammation and bone marrow failure. It's caused by acquired mutations in UBA1 and bone marrow stem cells. The elevated MCV is the key clue to spot the disease. Uh, not every patient has an elevated MCV, but many do. Um, and we think this is a prototype for a new disease paradigm, whereby somatic mutations in blood and even in solid organs may underlie adult onset rheumatologic diseases, and genetics can dynamically contribute to autoimmunity and inflammation. We just need to expand our thinking beyond germline genetics. Um, with that, I will acknowledge the people in our group in the vasculitis program at NIAMS and the broader team Vexus. This is a short list. There are many, many, many people. This really was a collaborative effort of over 60 investigators working together to solve a medical mystery. I'm very <laughs> grateful to many of these people and I'm happy to take questions. Thanks so much. Wow, that was a phenomenal talk. Um, people like us who have seen I think probably will have to start looking at vexes in everything that we don't understand in vasculitis. Um, there are numerous questions for you. Um, up is, um, we do see patients with um, uh, mutations, but is there an environmental trigger or any other trigger that you have identified that could have caused the mutation? We don't know. 
we we haven't identified a key trigger and we've been taking the histories of patients looking for that and nothing stands out. And furthermore, we don't know when the mutation first occurred, but our thinking is that the time from the initial mutation to disease presentation is likely short because when we sequenced the population in Pennsylvania at large, we every, every patient we found with a VEX, uh, UBA1 mutation had disease. It's not like we found patients that were asymptomatic. So we think the, the mutation is occurring much later in life and is um, quickly becoming leading to disease, but we're not sure. To me, that suggests that perhaps there's a component of immunosenescence or immune aging that's going on. And I would hypothesize that maybe UBA1 mutations are occurring all the time in throughout the lifespan in bone marrow randomly, but our immune system is able to control them. And yet as we get older, they can escape that mechanism somehow. And that's what leads to disease later in life. Thank you. It's an interesting question on anticoagulation. Do you actually wait for a thrombosis to anticoagulate or because you did say in prophylaxis about anticoagulation, I mean, what's the exact risk? Because you said the risk is much higher than in Beshe's. Uh, so do we wait? Who, who should be given the anticoagulation considering that it's an, a, a, a disease of the aged? Anticoagulation also has to be factored in. We don't know uh, yet how to about prophylactic anticoagulation. I wish we knew this, um, uh, and we're actively studying this. Uh, Yogan Kanthi's lab at NHLBI is, is is trying to understand the mechanisms of inflammation in these patients, and can we find a biomarker in blood that will help guide therapy? And for now, it's an area of debate. Um, you know, do do all the, should all these patients at least be on an aspirin? Probably. Do we need more aggressive anticoagulation? We're not sure. Um, and so we're still doing this, much like we do with antiphospholipid syndrome. We're still doing this in a reaction to uh, a thrombotic event, um, and hopefully this will be further defined. I think this is also where the international community is going to be really helpful to, to generate enough data to understand how to, how to approach this. But at least if a patient has had one event, we tend to then keep them on prophylactic therapy um, lifelong. It's another um, question saying, uh, which method do you use for genetic testing by sequencing or um, max NGS? So the one of the interesting things about the Vexus syndrome, it is very easy to detect in peripheral blood. So three milliliters of blood, you can sequence these patients and pick up the mutation. And you do not need to sequence them deeply because the mutation is so penetrant, it's, uh, it's present. So uh, we use Sanger sequencing to pick up the mutation, which means the variant allele fraction has to be at least 20%, but it's around you know 50% and higher in most patients. Um, so most of the testing strategies that we were using was were Sanger sequencing based. It, whole exome sequencing will also pick this up. And in the United States, at least, we had UBA1 added to the myelodysplastic syndrome NGS panel. And now that's commercially available. And that's what we recommend should happen in every country around the world. If you have a sequencing panel for myelodysplastic syndromes, the UBA1 gene needs to be included on that panel. You also said, told us that um, predominantly the first initial series was 100% male. But then also you went on to say that that's probably not the case now um, with few females being seen. Now, is the phenotype different in women? Is it a milder disease or do we see the same severe form? We don't know if the phenotype is different in women. There are some clues. In the Geisinger Institute, which is an unbiased approach of just sequencing the community, the, we found 11 patients. Nine were men, two were women, which is a much higher proportion than we would have expected. And when we looked at the medical records of those two women, they did have evidence of hematologic abnormalities and inflammation, but perhaps their hematologic abnormalities were um, more prominent than their inflammation. So I would guess that the phenotype may be more subtle in women and there may be less inflammation 
And because a lot of the initial description of this disease came from rheumatology, there is that referral bias of seeing patients with inflammation. And perhaps uh, we're going to pick up more women in hematology clinics. Um, uh, but it, all of that means that we just need to keep an open mind about how this disease is going to evolve. It keeps changing every week. If you um, can let me know again, what proportion of these bone marrows have vacuoles? And other than copper deficiency, is there anything else you need to look for when you see these vacuoles? Um, it, it depends on the series, but at least 90% of patients will have uh, the vacuoles in, in cohorts. Um, the things to exclude are copper deficiency, alcoholism, severe alcoholism leading to nutritional defects can do this, and myeloid cancers, my, myeloid neoplasia can be associated with it. So in general, there most of the things that cause these vacuoles would be obvious to a clinician um, if you put this in the correct clinical context. I think another important question which some people have asked is why do um, these patients have bad, uh, they react badly to anakendra? Well, uh, yeah. I don't know. Um, I think there is a component of pathogy to this disease. We've seen patients who have trauma to um, their arm or leg, and it takes a long time for the inflammation to resolve at that spot. And anakinra, um, specifically because it has citrate in it, does produce injection site reactions in most people who start the medication. And I think the Vexus syndrome patients have an exaggerated response to that because these mutant neutrophils and, mo and monocytes are going to those sites of inflammation in skin, and it's difficult to stop that process. Yeah, I think uh, there's one question or a curiosity from my side. Uh, do you suggest the autoimmune disease, which are fairly refractory to the conventional treatment, to be subjected to any of the genetic mutation studies? Say, for example, a lupus-like presentation, not really doing good. A vasculitis presentations with a little bit of uh, out of the normal predefined vasculitis criteria or characteristics. Uh, do you suggest these kind of cases being subjected for a genetic studies? Yes, I do, but I think for research. So these are the patients we should be studying for research. Those cases that you have in the in the if you think about genetic drivers of disease, so if you have aggregation in a family, those are easy to study. If you have very early onset disease, those are easy to study. And that's where most of our focus has been. On the adult side, the ones that I think we should preferentially be sequencing and studying are those patients who don't have a classic presentation of a disease. They're at the fringe of a disease. And we have a number of these patients in our clinic. You can have a patient who has lupus and they definitely have lupus, but you can have a patient who sort of has lupus. That's the closest you can get. These are the ones I think we really should be studying. In terms of sequencing them for clinical purposes, we're not at that point yet. Yes, you could consider sequencing for Vexa syndrome in almost any patient right now that isn't classic for a disease. I think that's, that's reasonable. But we're not at the point where we can start to take unusual cases, sequence them in the clinic, and provide some clarity. But we're going in that direction, and clearly the VEXA syndrome is teaching us that. I think those cases, though, the unusual things, have a, we have a lot to learn from, and these are the ones we should be sequencing and, and doing research on. Yeah, because uh, currently, I, I think, uh, as you uh, are aware of the literature, we are trying to reclassify to call it as polyautoimmune disease, single autoimmune disease, or uh, uh, autoimmune disease with autoinflammatory characters without autoantibodies. Uh, where can we really place this, and so that uh, so that we have some more, uh, especially the end group are likely to be the group who are going to contribute more on these areas of research, which are the place where they can really look into these kind of studies or these kind of uh, research works. Yeah, I think this is going to happen just throughout rheumatology, and this will happen naturally. If you look at disease taxonomy and classification of disease, it's mostly clinical-based, pattern recognition. And think about vasculitis, for example. How do we think about vasculitis? We think about it as small, medium, and large vessel vasculitis, which is great for teaching purposes, but it tells us nothing about the biology of the disease. 
And ultimately, I think two things will matter. The clinical phenotype will matter. It is always going to be important, but the molecular characterization will also be important. And in the future, our classification scheme, our disease taxonomy is going to be a marriage between clinical features and biologic features. Um, each of them are going to have an importance in how we define diseases. So coming back to the histopathology, um, is the histopathology from biopsies in vexus syndrome, especially the vasculitis uh, from the skin or other organs, is it any different histopathologically from your other medium vessel vasculitis? Yes, it can be. Um, so the sweet syndrome in Vexa syndrome isn't exactly like classic sweet syndrome. There are atypical features of inflammation in different places. The vasculitis can be not pure vasculitis. It can also involve, you know, a lot of, you know, um, uh, um, paniculitis accompanying with it. The patients that have giant cell arteritis often don't have classic transmural granulomatous inflammation. They tend to, with Vexa syndrome, they tend to have more adventitial inflammation. So I do think that just like the clinical features don't quite fit a diagnosis with this disease, it's the same principle with the histology. It doesn't quite fit. It's close to these things, but there are some unusual features. And um, a lot of papers are emerging, I think, doing more deep characteristics of the histology. And I think that's what the theme will be. Um, many times it can look exactly like one of these things, but often there's subtle differences. So with the various therapies, I know there's no one definitive therapy. You've been giving tocilizumab and various other things, but what sort of survival have you seen now with adding these therapies? Because once you make a diagnosis, you probably upfront, you're going to decide on some of the therapies other than corticosteroids. What sort of survival have you seen with these additional therapies? We don't know. It's a great question because... We are saying that there's a median survival time of 10 years, but most of that is based on cases that were identified retrospectively. And the hope is it, with early diagnosis and treatment, we can impact um, survival favorably. And I think that's a very important thing to conceptualize with this disease. Most rheumatologic conditions are relapsing, remitting diseases. And as rheumatologists, we hunt to find the correct medication that gets a patient into remission. Vexus is different. It's not a relapsing remitting disease. It is a progressive disease. It is a disease driven by a molecular clone that over time expands and the disease gets worse and worse and worse. So you're right. If we can actually intervene really early, if we can catch cases early, might we alter the trajectory and natural history of the disease in ways that we wouldn't normally with traditional rheumatologic conditions? I hope so. Um, that's why it's really important, at least at this point, we don't have great treatments other than steroids, but we can focus hard on making this diagnosis earlier and earlier. So amongst your cohort who've done well, I mean, whoever you're at present treating, um, have you seen any progression to malignancy? Put it the other way around, is Vexus a pre-malignant condition? We have not seen anybody have overt blast and, and develop acute my, myeloid leukemias, uh, unlike the other forms of MDS. We, patients can evolve into myelodysplastic syndromes and develop disease-defining mutations from MDS. Um, and we have seen a smaller subset of patients develop multiple myeloma, which is interesting because you know that's a plasma cell-driven disease, a lymphocyte-driven disease, and those cells do not have the mutation. So plasma cells in the, a patient with Vexus syndrome with multiple myeloma don't have the UBA1 mutation. That's probably an off-target effect. An unhealthy toxic marrow is leading to selection of you know, these myeloma clones. Um, uh, we, we think maybe there's also a signal of solid cancers in these patients, prostate and, and the like, but we're not quite sure about that. And that's possibly just secondary again to bad systemic un, um, inflammation that's difficult to treat. So is this a pre-malignant disease? Yes, in, a sen in one sense it is. I think it's just a classic overlap disease of rheumatology and hematology. It really deserves to be in its own category. In the cohorts you've seen, or even worldwide, um, is there any ethnic bias um, like other diseases, or is this seen across ethnicities? We don't know yet enough of that, but we are definitely seeing it being reported in every corner of the world. So 
I suspect that this is a ubiquitous disease. Yeah. And regarding the treatment, there are a couple of, you know, of course, people want to ask some naive questions. Like you talked about tocilizumab. Do you prefer the IV or the or the, the subcute one? What are your choices as far as the conventional drugs are concerned if you have to prioritize which one over the other? Uh, so we often, we use tocilizumab early and we often combine it with methotrexate. Um, tocilizumab in Vexus syndrome is interesting because uh, most diseases for whom you give a patient tocilizumab, their C-reactive protein becomes undetectable. That's not often true with Vexus syndrome. We can give them subcutaneous or even escalate up to higher doses of intravenous tocilizumab and they still have C-reactive proteins, 30, 40 milligrams per liter, um, which I think speaks to the uh, true inflammatory nature of the disease. Where we get into trouble with tocilizumab is it, it, the side effects of neutropenia and thrombocytopenia can occur in our patients. So as we try to increase the dose of tocilizumab to drive down the C-reactive protein, we offer, often encounter worsening neutropenia. Um, and this has been the problem with many of the types of drugs, uh, JAK inhibitors as well. You can try to put them on JAK inhibitors to control inflammation, and then the uh, JAK2 inhibition side effects of JAK inhibitors lead to worsening cytopenias, and uh, it's, a, it's a very difficult thing to manage. Yeah, and one question regarding any experience with colchicine, somebody has asked. Um... Uh, we've used it. Um, it may have some efficacy for some of the subtle inflammatory uh, things like the ear chondritis and such, but it's usually not sufficient to control the inflammation, the inflammatory burden. All right. I think, uh, Ramesh, any other question that you can, can think of? People are also interested to know uh, what about, um, there are lots and lots of questions. I mean, it's the, I think it's been a buzz despite the, the, the lack of interest that people had developed in between on online platforms. We've had a fantastic response today and so many questions some have been on the vacuoles so uh, how many patients really do have vacuoles although the acronym says vacuoles and are what are the differentials when somebody says inflammatory disease and sees vacuoles and may not have other things so what are the other differential that one would consider if you think that these are the two things which i think i could look at yeah, it's important to understand that the vacuoles define the V in Vexus, but it's not an absolute requirement. There are patients who have Vexus syndrome without the vacuoles. They're in the minority, maybe 5% or fewer. Um, and as we mentioned, if you see a patient with the vacuoles, you would want to consider nutritional deficiencies like copper, copper deficiency and myeloid cancers. The key thing, though, to emphasize is if you have a patient who had a bone marrow biopsy, you see the vacuoles on the aspirates. So you have to look at the aspirate to see the vacuoles. And they're often, as I mentioned, not reported upon or missed by the hematopathologist Be until there's more awareness about this disease, they may not report them. So it is worthwhile if you have a patient in whom you clinically suspect vexus and you read the report of the marrow aspirate and it doesn't mention vacuoles, is to sit down with the hematopathologist and repeat the review of the aspirate, and often you will see them. Um, and so that's one of the first things we do. If we get contacted for a patient with suspected uh, vexus who has had a bone marrow, was we ask the teams to re-review the aspirate. And, I, think, you know, I mean, coming back to the vacuoles, um, what proportion of cells have it? I mean, is it numerous vacuoles in numerous cells, few vacuoles in some cells? What, what, what is it like? It's typically numerous vacuoles in um, uh, these erythroid myeloid precursor cells. And then the vacuoles get fewer and fewer as cells mature. So if you look at peripheral circulating neutrophils in blood, most of those do not have vacuoles. If you look very carefully at a lot of smear data, you can see one or two that have the vacuoles. So over time, the matured myeloid cells lose the vacuoles or, they, or maybe they're the ones that didn't have them to begin with. Um, uh, and there has been some, including work from our group, looking at correlating the number of vacuoles with disease severity and does it function as a prognostic marker? And I, I think that's unclear. I think another thing based upon what you're saying, uh, you talked about the, the correlation with bad outcomes with a particular type of genetic mutation, but are there any clinical, you uh, clinical differences between depending upon the, that's one question. And the another one I will say is that if with venous thrombosis, uh, 
as people obviously want to see whether antiphospholipid syndrome, APLA antibodies, have there been uh, reports of APLA antibodies in the ones who have had venous thrombosis? I mean, you know, yeah. they've been without it also. So these two questions. So um, in terms of clinical prognostic factors, I mentioned the valine variant as being a prognostic factor. The strongest prognostic factor for death is becoming transfusion dependent. So a patient who starts to require frequent red blood cell transfusions, that is a very bad prognostic sign. And that is a patient potentially, if they're healthy enough, should strongly consider um, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. The other clinical factor, because we've looked at a number of them, the other one that has prognostic information is chondritis. And that's favorable. So the patients who had ear chondritis tended to have longer survival than the patients who didn't. And that could be lead time bias that these patients are being detected earlier. So therefore we think that they're living, they're surviving longer, um, but it's unclear. So those are the three factors is transfusion dependence, the valine variant are being negative predictors of survival and then ear chondritis being a, a favorable predictor. Um, and then in terms of uh, thromboembolic disease and their antibody profile, antibody profile in these patients in general is quite interesting. Uh, many of them will be ANA positive. Many of them have a positive ANCA antibody, and therefore they are thought to potentially have, um, uh, you know, ANCA-associated vasculitis. Almost all of them have a lupus anticoagulant. Uh, fewer of them have cardiolipin antibodies. Um, and I don't think that the clotting signal in the disease is purely just a, an antiphospholipid syndrome phenomenon. I think there's additional disease-specific factors, um, in particular, just the amount of severe inflammation that these patients tend to have. So, I mean, coming to therapeutics, there's a question here saying, can we combine mycophenolate morphetal with azacitidine? Yeah, this is a great question. I don't know the answer to it, but what I we do think maybe... As I mentioned, there's those two major plans to treat the disease, control inflammation and eradicate the clone. Perhaps this is what we need to consider is azacitidine as a way to sort of target the clone combined with some, some form of anti-inflammatory therapy. And the, the key message here is that it, these patients require multidisciplinary care. And really hematologists and rheumatologists should be seeing these patients and working together to care for patients with this disease. And for the longest time, these patients would go between their rheumatologist and the hematologist. And the rheumatologist would say, I can't get your inflammation under control, but your bone marrow is failing, go see your hematologist. And the hematologist would say, your bone marrow is failing, but it's because of your inflammation, go see your rheumatologist. And the patients would go back and forth with no help. And I think now that we've defined the disease and we understand the mechanism of disease a little better, it really speaks to the idea that this is a disease that should be co-managed by hematology and rheumatology. And those types of points or those types of questions are exactly the ones that we need to try to figure out. So what proportion of your patients have actually landed up for a transplant? I mean, um, uh, has it, does it help? Sorry, I lost you a little bit. Did you say what proportion? To ask is regarding uh, bone marrow transplant. What proportion of patients have had transplant, bone marrow transplant, and does it help? Yeah, so we've had, we know of 12 patients in the NIH cohort who've had transplant. And as I mentioned, 11 of them, we think it was curative for, but we have not performed a transplant at the NIH for this disease. We just launched a research protocol to do that. And we're, we're hopefully going to start doing that because what we want to look at is if you transplant a patient, do you completely eradicate the clone? Is it durable for long periods of time? When you condition a patient for transplant, do you need to completely wipe out all of the marrow? Or is can you be permissive of some residual clone that then the immune system will take care of? All of these questions we need to figure out both at the human level and we need an animal model of disease because I think that will really help us. Um, and so David Beck, uh, who's now who left the NIH and is now at NYU, that's one of, I think his research initiatives is trying to develop an animal model for the disease. I think in line with what you've said, so basically you had a lot, relatively larger cohort at the NIH. What made you choose these 12 patients? So are there any, what the people want to ask is, when do we really fast track the marrow transplant in a given patient? 
it's really challenging because it's a brand new disease. The natural history is still being defined. And you're talking about a procedure where the mortality could be up to 20%. So you need to be careful in who you select. Um, and the other problem, like most transplant, is the patients have to be healthy enough to undergo transplant. So you probably need to do it earlier than you may want to do it. Um, and that is the fundamental challenge. I think patients that have become red blood cell transfusion dependent, often they still are good candidates for transplantation. Those are patients that we would strongly consider. Patients who have very refractory inflammation, who are on 20 milligrams or more of daily prednisone for months and cannot get below that, and you're starting to see infectious complications and otherwise, those are also patients that we would strongly consider. And then you have to think about age limits for transplantation. Where do you set that limit? Can you transplant a 70-year-old, a 75-year-old? Is Should there be absolute age cutoffs or should it be based on functional status? Um, all of these are questions that need to be defined. But for us, very bad resistant inflammation uh, and uh, progressive bone marrow failure are the things that we look for. And then we really are trying to key in on those patients with the valine variant and, and maybe making a decision sooner than later. Yeah. I think, uh, 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 Ramesh, I think we've had and covered, I think, most of the questions. Maybe we might have so many, the list is so long. The both of us, while we've been looking at it, may have might have missed, but I think by and large, thank you so much for being patient and trying to answer all our queries. Some of them very naive, and and obviously people are excited. And I think did we is there any last minute questions of um, uh, Ramesh or do we? Um I think we can. And the question and answers has covered most of the I think probable we, doubts one can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. very nice uh, this thing. And uh, I think we yeah. are at the end. And I would, we, it's been one of the most mesmerizing talks on a very exciting topic. And I think, uh, Ramesh, do we ask our president elect yes, to, to formally thank uh, Dr. Peter Grayson on behalf of IRA? For taking I, I, time I, out. Yes. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you so much from my side. From the asset, I think uh, the Thank WhatsApp of IRA is uh, telling that. Great learning. Yeah. I think WhatsApp messages in the IRAs are continuously pouring in to say that it was a mesmerizing talk. It was a wonderful talk. And it has made a lot of things clear to the people who were who had an intention to know about this disease and it's re it's really it's it is really nice of you uh, sparing your time especially the morning hours i, the, I think it, it's it must be pretty cold up there <laughs> and that is sunday uh, thank you very much uh, uh, i think thank you and if i could add that peter we'll look forward to you interacting with our ira family uh, as and when you can i mean when we wish to hear from you on certain aspects where we feel we, learn, we need to learn from the, the people, do it right away. And I think we look forward to more associations, more such in it, you know, we look forward to you. Uh, I want to come to India and learn directly from you guys. Cause yeah, uh, you're most welcome. Yeah. You're more, most welcome. Most most, welcome. We'll, be, we'll be happy to have you. I mean, you can come for our, our next <laughs> national meeting. If I could say that. <laughs> I've never been, but I really do want to go. It's on my list oh, of places. Great, to see. great pleasure. I think uh, if you are interested in coming to India, I this think year, this year, Hyderabad next year, it will be in Bangalore. We will be. So you can choose. You can either come to Hyderabad. The president elect is sitting here. So who else? <laughs> <laughs> we'll be more than happy. Everybody would be overjoyed to have you amongst us. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I think, uh, we can close thank the discussions with that. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Peter. <laughs>